a game well known for its very unique art style, The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. Sporting an art style that isn't just cell shaded but rendered the cast, the enemies, and the whole world into looking like a playable cartoon. But during Wind Waker's development, the world didn't always look the way it did. Characters evolved, settings changed, and many designs were outright never used. And so, today on Cut Content, we'll be looking at the beta designs of The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the subscribe button and hit the like button too to further support us and keep creating new videos. When Wind Waker was being conceived, the team at Nintendo was trying to come up with how the game should look, as director of the game, Eiji Onuma, was not pleased with how the Space Road 2000 tech demo looked. But soon designer Yoshiki Haruhana came up with the first design of Link, and with that setting the art style for the rest of the game. Coming up with this link here, which this version was also seen in the first controversial trailer of the game at that. Drawn in a style that looked very similar to his final incarnation, outside of the brown undershirt, as opposed to the lime green one from the final game. But this isn't even remotely close to being it for the designs of Link for this game, as several very different pieces also were considered. One concept here is of an aging Link. Not adult, but literally aging. The piece here is of a Link in three different stages of his life. The idea I theorized they had is that they wished for Link to slowly age in the game and showcase years passing as the story progressed. Maybe even two time skips depending on the events. Especially since this one art exists here of Adult Link amongst the three, finding Ganondorf at the very end, which will return to Ganondorf later in this video. In this case, we have Teenage Link, who looks like Young Link, but with a bigger body and smaller head. But Adult Link here is where it really changes, sporting proportions much closer to his Ocarina of Time build, even if still much cartoonier. Aside from this design of Adult Link, there is a less cartoony design here too, where he had more realistic proportions. Granted, this was the only design for it, versus the other three Adult Link designs that have a more cartoony look to them. On to Tetra slash Zelda. The likely earliest design didn't look like a pirate at all, with her dressed in white garbs, which Hyrule Historia says are supposed to evoke a sense of the South? I guess rich 1800s southern girl may have been the idea here for her story. But her tan skin was here from the get-go, and seems her underlings were there too. Possible the one with the axes is Gonzo or Senza, not sure who the other is though. However, at that point, it seems they were more testing ideas for designs for Zelda and her underlings, which one that was simply in sketch existed too, that has her looking more like a bandit alongside her underlings. This leading us straight into the pirate designs. Which starting with this one, we have a Tetra that was starting to look more piratey, but had a long ponytail and fully dressed in yellow. Meanwhile, we then got our princess version too, sporting a dress that somewhat resembles the final game's theme, but comes with a cape, hair and braids, and her skin staying tanned while in Zelda mode. Meanwhile, this version is a lot closer to the final games, with the vest, knife, and scarf in place but still with long hair. Meanwhile, Zelda was starting to get her dress closer to her final incarnation, with a front piece now in place and her hair starting to match, as well as a tan skin being gone now. And finally, we get to a design of Tetra that is very similar to the final games, except her top is a little low cut here. Truly trying to be as free as a pirate could be, but not by the final game. What's interesting is they even considered giving her red eyes too, looking extra creepy with them. Almost like she's possessed! Potentially that was gonna be a story beat at one point? Meanwhile, this version of Zelda here had a dress very similar to the final games, with small differences, like her collar and her hair being in a ponytail instead, while missing her crown. Now moving past the two protagonists, we come to our boat, the King of Red Lions. While looking like a red stern lion in the final game, his original design was quite the contrast, having much more of an eastern style in design, and looking more dragon-like in fact, with several variations of that. One having a long neck that could grow too. The boat itself as well looking very different, being bigger and deeper, with a simpler sail too. Now we looked at Tetra's underlings earlier, but here we have another later design for them, in their pirate designs this time. These ones looking a lot tougher and meaner than the final ones of that. The one with the blue bandana looking a lot like Nico. 
who didn't look like the type to make Link want to play a bunch of platforming games with him. The one on the right is dressed like Gonzo, but about 150 pounds heavier and with a goatee. Meanwhile, the center one being Sensa potentially, with that big beard, and the blue he sports is the same color as his ancestor had worn that served the old Princess Zelda as seen in this painting. Now, the great Deku tree we see in the final game had an especially derpy and cartoony look to him, looking very friendly. Meanwhile, this version had a much grumpier appearance to him, with sharp twigs all around representing hair and beard, let alone actually having hands where he is gifting Link with this Deku leaf. Moving on to the races of the Great Sea, let's start with the Koroks. The Koroks, while always having a wooden body to go, had differences with their leafy face, being that they had smaller leaves for one, including Makar himself, but also blue and purple leaves were also being considered too, before sticking to just the more realistically colored ones. Now the newest race, the Ritos, had a jarringly large evolution to what became their final bird design. In one instance, the Rito had a more penguin-like design, but with more of a nose than a beak in fact. Eventually, more bird-like designs kicked in, with various bird designs being there, unlike the final game with one set bird design. Eventually, they wanted the Rito to have larger wings, as they were set to fly quite often, so they decided to redesign them with bigger wings for the final game. Now here are two completely cut races from the game. The first is this yeti looking race, being completely covered in fur even the women with only their top knots being different. Starting to sound a lot like the Lord of the Rings dwarves here. And they are always angry and bounce when angry. Their children also hide within their fur and are actually hairless for the most part, only coming out when their hair grows. The other cut race, however, are these... Race of Magic Beans. I guess Link planting all those magic beans on Ocarina of Time finally flourished into these guys. Apparently, they would be hanging off trees and drop down to talk to Link, with this one even letting Link climb him to the top of a mountain. Potentially, they might have been set to live within the Great Deku Tree alongside the Koroks even, or somewhere else entirely considering this one does speak of a mountain. Now moving away from the friendly cast, let's move on to the enemies of the Great Sea, which a lot of these had some serious differences. Beginning with the most fodder-like enemy, the Bokoblins. Their general design looked the same, but initially were purple and had more of a cleaver than a giant knife to start. The Keys had a very different design originally, having an actual fat belly, bigger wings and tails, while sporting a more serious face and different color palette. Now Dark Nuts had a very different design, with much simpler armor, potentially resembling the 2D Zelda variety more, along with giant shields and much smaller swords. Their helmet, however, resembled the final games, including the horns. Now looking into bosses here, the Helmrock King looked quite similar to his final design, but had some different coloring, like having a white neck instead, and missing some other stripes, as well as having a more rounded facial armor. Now for our favorite lobster, Goma, while having the general idea for its design, it did still have several differences. Its shell form appeared to have a black head initially, and with a white mouth, and that very white mouth protruding outwards heavily. The de-shelled form on the other hand, while white entirely, had that full protruding mouth still there, but was missing the pincers. The Stalfa, while having their general skeleton design, were equipped very differently, having a short sword as opposed to a giant mace, along with actually wearing armor. Now next to the Stalfa appears to be a cut enemy, bringing us to the category of cut enemies. Having a body shape that is a lot like a Moblin, including these hoofed feet. In fact, this may be an elite Moblin soldier who would have used two axes and wears this big helmet instead. For this one, it was probably a boss that they were considering who was going to be massive and look to be in the family of Bokoblins, potentially their literal strongest member, sporting two giant spiked clubs and a beard to boot. Meanwhile, chained down by the leg, potentially by Gandor for how dangerous he is. After all, he was going to even try to eat Moblins here. In fact, he may have been the boss of one of those two cut dungeons from the game as such. In relation, what we have may be an Archer Ninja-like Bokoblin. I can see this guy being a mini boss to this guy's dungeon, just jetting around the mini boss room and shooting Lynch constantly. Next, we have another dual wielding enemy, with him described as incredibly good with a sword and unbeatable at sword fighting. While Dark Knots were probably our best normal enemy sword fighter in the final game, this guy might have topped that. 
Wouldn't be surprised if he semi fought like Gandorf does based on the two swords. Next to him is yet another dual wielder, with a mace in one hand and either a flaming trident in the other, or just candles. I'm gonna go with candles here, since his garb has a more occult look to it. Would fit well into the Earth Temple though. Now here's a very unique enemy, a gargoyle. Not too many flying enemies in the final game, but if he made it in, I can see him doing strong lunges, and even getting on the ground to do powerful swipes. Next is one that was partially colored, looking almost like an old school moblin. But we know it's not the original design for the moblins either, as that design was made right after Lynx was made. This potentially being a variation of the moblins rather. Seeing as he has a club, maybe he is more like that big clubbed moblin from Ocarina of Time. The last of the cut enemies appears to be a cut sea creature for this lost underwater scene in the game. In the last video, I theorized this was actually for a cut water dungeon of sorts, considering we see Link swimming around something not done in the final game, the existence of transparent water and water boots within the data. This boss, I theorized, might have been the original Morpheal in fact, considering the underwater boss fight here, the sharp fins, what might be a big center eye that can be his weak point, and the mouth that kinda resembles the Twilight Princess version too. But in the end, all roads lead to Ganondorf. With Ganondorf, as seen earlier when facing off against a fully grown Link, he had a clear different design then, sporting long hair and different armor, along with only one sword, as opposed to the short-haired rope design that featured two swords. We even have a bust shot of this version in color too, which while it may look more armor-like here, could still very well have been a rope design, but the next design appears to come much closer to the final game's design. Wearing the robes we know, but with a different pattern and color scheme at that. Giving a nice contrast look to this older and more middle aged Ganondorf for the game that has him reflecting at the end. But as Wind Waker's art style was established, the game's design evolved and grew to create what became an instant classic. Many initially found the art style off putting. But over time, these designs that grew so much over two years found their ways into people's hearts and minds and are remembered fondly for their unique and charming look. But designs of characters and enemies aren't all that changed. But in fact, a horde of maps were changed too over this period. These very maps that I plan to explore soon. So hit the subscribe button for I plan to be back with more Zelda and other games cut content soon. Hit the like button and comment below on which beta maps were your favorite. So everyone, Thank you for watching.